Again, hello everybody. I'm Scott Kaler, President and Chief Scientist of Weather Logics. I'm joined today with by my colleague Matt DeSorcy, Chief Meteorologist at Weather Logics, and we're excited to talk to you today about hailstorms in Canada, how we track, predict, monitor these storms, and some of the new work that we're doing in this area. So today, just a few reminders. Um, the webinar will be recorded, so for those that were unable to attend, we will circulate the recording afterwards. It will be posted on YouTube. We'll have time at the end for questions, so if you do have any, feel free to post them in the chat throughout, and we'll also have time for you to do that at the end. Uh, microphones and cameras are disabled, but <clears throat> the chat should be available for your questions. And we'll also have occasional quizzes throughout the uh, presentation. We'll just do those. We won't um, have a prompt for you to answer it, but if you'd like to submit an answer, you can also do that in the chat. So with that, we'll start with our first speaker, who is Matt DeSorcy. Matt is the chief meteorologist and co-founder of WeatherLogix, a lifelong resident of Winnipeg. Matt has been passionate about weather from a very young age, when his family got caught in a severe hailstorm. Since then, he has brought his passion to a new level and has earned his Bachelor of Science in Atmospheric Science at the University of Manitoba. Matt also does most of our day-to-day -day weather prediction for many of our clients, such as our uh, farmers and our uh, government clients. So Matt, uh, take it away. All right, thanks, Scott. Uh, thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, here are the topics that we'll be discussing today. So I'll be talking about how hailstone, our hailstorms work, and then that'll be followed by Scott will be giving an overview of the 2023 hail season. He'll be discussing how we track hailstorms here at WeatherLogix, and then finally, uh, right at the end, he will give a 2024, 2024 hail forecast for the Canadian prairies. All right, next slide. So starting off how hailstorms work, uh, here's a quick quiz to get everyone involved right away. Uh, which picture shows hail in this slide? So uh, this could uh, be a trick question to some. Uh, is it A, B, C, all of the above? Uh, please give an answer in the chat if you can. If not, I'll give the answer in about 10 seconds here. But uh, let's take a poll of what everyone thinks. Uh, what's hail? Which picture shows hail here? Seeing some C's in the chat already. Give it a couple more seconds here. All of the above. Five more seconds if anyone else has a, an answer. All the above. So a couple all the above, a couple C's. Uh, in this case, correct answer would be C. Uh, so A, A is actually showing ice pellets uh, compared to a coin. Ice pellets are not considered hail. Ice pellets uh, form through different means in the cloud. So ice pellets would form as snow falls through a uh, warm layer in the atmosphere, melts the snowflake, and then that that particle refreezes into a small ball of ice. That's not uh, considered hail at this uh, point. And then B uh, is actually graupel. So graupel is uh, rhyming occurring on a snowflake, which kind of looks like a ball, but uh, it's not a ball in this case. So the correct answer would be C. And uh, by definition, hail needs to be at least five millimeters in diameter to be considered hail. And uh, that meets that criteria in C. So congrats to everyone that said C. Can move on to the next slide. So where does hail come from? Hail is produced by thunderstorms. It requires a rapidly rising warm and humid uh, air yeah, within the thunderstorms. So uh, that's uh, called the updraft part of the storm. And then we have a graph here on the right side of the slide, uh, which is quite interesting. So we combined uh, here at WeatherLogix, we have a hail database. Uh, so we combined all the reports by month here from 2017 to 2023. 
And you can clearly see that the hail season peaks here in Canada in July. And uh, you get the shoulder seasons in April and May where there are a few reports, but uh, the peak of the hail season is really from uh, June to August here, uh, where we recorded over 3,000 reports uh, over the past six years here in Canada uh, in July alone. All right, next slide. And here's just thunderstorm animation time lapse. Uh, if you watch clouds, uh, thunderstorm clouds for a while, uh, while outside, you can typically see their updrafts building. And the updraft part of the storm here would be the, the white part in the center where it's kind of bubbling. And that's where the, the hail typically develops. Uh, we'll have a schematic of it later in this presentation, but that's really where the hail part uh, develops. And then the other thing to note here, or the other interesting part in this uh, animation is that the upper level clouds are kind of moving away from us, you can tell, uh, whereas the, the lower level clouds are kind of moving left to right. And that just shows that uh, the atmosphere is sheared. So shear means change in wind direction and wind speed with height. And to have hail development, uh, you typically need moderately to strongly sheared environments. So in this case, uh, it's likely a moderately or strongly sheared environment, which would mean that there's likely hail falling out of this updraft. Um, and just that shear is important because it keeps the updraft part of the storm separate from the downdraft. The downdraft would be where the hail and rain falls, so it's, it'd be the darker right side on this picture, whereas the updraft is kind of where the air is rising, uh, warm, humid air is rising into the storm and hail development occurs. So shear is important for thunderstorms and you can you can kind of see the shear occurring in this time lapse here. Right, next slide. So here's just a quick satellite imagery. Uh, this is in Wyoming, Colorado in the States, but you can see uh, similar terrain effects here in Canada and Alberta. Uh, often during the summer, uh, just thunderstorm development off terrain. Uh, often with terrain here, you get thunderstorms developing in pretty scattered locations, uh, not very uh, linear or anything, but you can often see them forming off uh, terrain. Uh, in this case, in the Lee of the Rockies in Alberta, it'd be the same case, uh, but often with thunderstorms in the prairies too, you could get uh, thunderstorms developing off, developing off fronts. Uh, but you can also get terrain terrain effects here in the prairies, such as the Riding Mountains, Duck Mountains, as I mentioned, the foothills in Alberta. Uh, even the Manitoba Lakes can be a uh, focus for storm development here in the prairies. So this is just a quick time lapse to see to show you guys what the storm development or the updraft development looks like on satellite. All right, next slide, Scott. And we looked at that time lapse uh, earlier in this presentation. Here's what a schematic of that uh, time lapse would look like if you took a snapshot of that updraft. What would it look like and what's happening here in the updraft? Uh, so the main thing to look for is the where it shows the pathway of the hailstone. So it's kind of that uh, gray dotted line there uh, moving through the updraft. Uh, so the hailstone initially develops as an embryo kind of at the bottom part of the updraft. And then as that embryo travels through the updraft, it uh, accumulates uh, some rain droplets on its surface or super cool droplets on its surface and gradually grows as it travels through that updraft. And then it's kind of sustained within that drop updraft for a while before it falls back to the ground. And by the time it falls to the ground, that's where uh, you see the larger hailstone reach the ground. So it, it kind of gradually grows as it moves uh, upwards through the updraft, uh, passes through the updraft, and then finally makes its way down. Uh, within, you can see within this uh, thunderstorm schematic. And then also, interestingly, uh, it's uh, sometimes you do see uh, different sized hailstones. So uh, if a a hailstone is persistently facing downwards. You can often see like conical shapes or various different types of shapes. So next time you do experience a hailstone or a hailstorm, just uh, it'd be interesting for you guys to look at uh, what types of shapes you're currently seeing. And you can kind of 
tell by the shape uh, what the trajectory was through that updraft. All right, next slide. And just following up with the uh, how the hail develops here within the updraft, there's typically four main types of hail growth uh, within a thunderstorm. The first one would be wet growth. Wet gro growth would be the top right image here on the slide. And this is typically where you see clear hail develop. So this one you can see it's a bit opaque, but it's not white as the other examples. And this clear hail typically forms when the embryo uh, is covered by rain droplets and those rain droplets slowly freeze onto the hail embryo. And then this allows the air bubbles to escape. So in other examples on the slide here where the hail is whiter, the air bubbles aren't allowed to escape. Uh, but in this case, wet growth, uh, the air bubbles are allowed to escape before uh, it freezes over. And then uh, this typically leads to the hailstone being somewhat uh, denser and harder. So you often see even nickel size hail do quite a bit of damage to, to vehicles and structures uh, when it's clear hail uh, through wet growth like this. The next type would be dry growth. Uh, so dry growth is where uh, the hail embryo passes through the updraft, but uh, super cool water droplets collide with the uh, the hail embryo, and then that uh, allows the air bubbles to be trapped within the hailstones. That's why it kind of looks whiter in the image. And these uh, hailstones are typically softer. Uh, there's more air trapped within the hailstone you would need slightly larger hailstones to cause more severe damage with the dry growth hailstones. And then uh, other examples here, combination. Sometimes you do get uh, hailstones where the interior is white. Uh, so dry growth occurred initially. And then finally, as the, the hailstone was falling out of the updraft, uh, wet growth occurred on the outside of the hailstone. So these, uh, these are pretty common too. Uh, in the Canadian prairies here, and they do cause quite significant damage because you get that clear coating around the hailstone, uh, which is denser and harder. And then finally, uh, last one is the aggregate hailstone uh, in the top left picture. This top left picture was actually taken in Pine Falls, Manitoba, a few years ago from a, a storm that went through. And the aggregate stones are um, a bit more complex. You get uh, lots of hailstones combined together within one. So if you can see, if you can uh, look into this image here, you can see that uh, there's multiple hailstones within the, the larger hailstones. And these, uh, you typically see these aggregate hailstones with larger hail sizes. So anywhere from golf ball or larger, uh, you can get these aggregates develop where it's multiple hailstones that are fused into one. All right, uh, next slide, Scott, please. And the last thing I'd like to talk about here is thunderstorm behavior. Uh, so sometimes the radar gives hints as to which storms are producing hail and which ones are not. Uh, this is just a radar animation from the States uh, earlier this year. Uh, but the main thing to look for often is where you see, uh, so here in this radar image, you can see most of the storms are moving from left to right from east or west to east uh, but you see some cells a couple cells are deviating a bit from that path um, there's a couple that are showing purples here uh, which are deviating a bit uh, they're moving more southeast rather than straight east and often the radar gives hints as to uh, which storms are producing in this case it would be the ones that are deviating uh, which are producing some larger hail uh, showing supercell characteristics all right, uh, next slide, Scott. I think that's it. Uh, so I'll pass it on to Scott, which will will give an update on the 2023 hail season. Thanks, everyone. <clears throat> yeah, thanks, Matt. Um, so now you know all about how hail forms. I'm going to talk more about how we monitor storms and also some of the data that we've been collecting. So first of all, I wanted to go back to 2023 because it was a very interesting year for hail across Canada. We saw pretty extreme conditions, and by that 
I mean, both ends of the spectrum. In Manitoba and Ontario, we saw very ha active hail years, whereas in Saskatchewan, which is normally one of our most active hail provinces, it was actually a very inactive year. So some significant events to highlight. Um, one of them was in Winnipeg on August 24th. A severe storm moved through the north side of the city, causing serious property damage. And I believe this event was characterized as a catastrophic loss event, which means that the total damage exceeded $25 million. So a lot of vehicles were damaged, uh, roofs, gazebos, things of that nature. There was also crop damage on this day as well in other parts of the province. And in Ontario, uh, we saw some of the largest hailstones ever recorded in the province of Ontario during the hail season last year. Ontario has always received hail, but it's never been known as one of the really hail prone provinces. So that's something that we're keeping an eye on to see if we're starting to get more hail events there. Going back to the prairies, though, another significant event, July 15th in Calgary, a uh, severe storm there. Calgary is the, probably um, you know, widely considered the most hail prone city in Canada, part of the most hail prone region being the foothills of the Rockies in Alberta. So that's not really unusual for them, but uh, of course, anytime a hailstorm hits Calgary, there is typically quite a bit of damage. So another little quiz, and you can answer this in the chat too if you like. Since 2017, which province has averaged the most hail reports? I'll give you 10 seconds if you want to submit an answer to that one. And I'm seeing some people saying Alberta, some people saying Saskatchewan. Correct answer is Alberta. Um, Alberta's far and away averaged the most hail uh, events by year. That's been long running, so you could go back even farther than the last five or six years. Uh, Alberta almost always leads the country in hail reports and uh, certainly has averaged the most as well. So this graph is showing you all hail reports by year. Uh, from 2019 to 2023. And then if we just look at severe hail reports, and we define severe as being a uh, hail diameter greater than two centimeters, which is about uh, nickel-sized hail, Alberta also averages the most of those reports too. Depending on the year, sometimes other provinces will get close to Alberta's number of severe hail events. Um, last year, for example, Manitoba and Ontario, they didn't quite reach Alberta levels, but they were getting close. And if you look back at 2019, um, you know, Saskatchewan had quite a few. So depends by year, but typically Alberta will lead this category as well. Then normally Saskatchewan will be second, Manitoba third, and Ontario fourth. Here's a map showing all of our uh, recorded hail events on the Canadian prairies in 2023. This map is in partnership with Co-op Hail Insurance, who is a crop hail insurer. Uh, so what we've done is combine their claims data with our hail reports data, and the map shows you um, the number of hail reports by or the number of sections affected by hail in each prairie township. So the more red uh, townships had more hail reports and the green ones had the least, or I guess I should say the, the blank ones, the white ones had zero, but on the scale, uh, the green is the lowest with one. So those are just some stats on hail. In terms of what we're doing to monitor these storms and improve our understanding, one thing is that we've begun to develop partnerships. Um, two of our key partnerships are with Co-op Hail Insurance, who I showed some of uh, the data from on the previous map. Uh, we've been providing them with hail mapping on a daily basis, and I'll give some examples of what that looks like. And we've also been doing a lot of data exchange to help to understand what was the total extent of areas affected by hail each year. Another key partnership is with the Northern Hail Project. This is an academic research group which studies hail across Canada. They're based at Western University and we've also been working with them on hail research and sharing uh, data to improve understanding of hail to make sure that we're always at the leading edge of the science on this topic. We've also developed another partnership uh, with an insurer which will be announcing soon, so you can keep an eye out for that. 
Our hail database is one of our key tools for monitoring hail activity in Canada. Our hail database contains all hail reports across the country of all different sizes and locations. And when we talk about a hail report, what we're referring to is an actual measurement of hail that happens. So what was the diameter of a hailstone, the time it happened, and the location that it happened. So you can consider this ground truth data shows exactly um, you know, what happened and where it happened based on actual hailstones that we were able to collect through various means of reporting. So this is our map showing all the hail reports we've collected since 2017. To date, over 8,000 of them. And you can see that every blue dot represents one report. So these reports tend to be most concentrated in two areas, one being the agricultural part of the prairies and the other part being in southern Ontario and southern Quebec. Now, there's a few reasons for this. One of them is just the obvious. Those are the areas that tend to get the most hailstorms. The more southern parts of Canada are more hail prone than uh, the Arctic. But the other thing is that there is a bit of a reporting bias because in these agricultural areas, you tend to have higher population densities and people who are located kind of all throughout the region. Um, whereas when you get into the boreal forest, typically people are just concentrated in small towns with very little or anything in between them. And so we don't collect a lot of reports outside of those small towns. So if you look at Northern Ontario, you do see reports there, but they're really just in those towns because there's simply nobody elsewhere to observe the hail events and report them. So just uh, another view of the map I showed earlier, zoomed in here. So you can really see you know, where hail is happening across the prairies. And this was last year's map. So we do see that there was a lot of activity in all of the provinces, but actually Saskatchewan received less hail activity than normal. Uh, Alberta was roughly normal. Keep in mind though, this map doesn't include insurance claims for Alberta because we don't receive uh, data from there. But for Saskatchewan and Manitoba, um, it includes the hail insurance claims as well. Manitoba um, was quite active last year. A lot of claims came in, also a lot of reports. Um, interestingly though, while it was an active year for hail, other severe weather like tornadoes, which are normally somewhat correlated with hail, uh, tornado activity wasn't very high. So that was a bit of an interesting note. Um, but nevertheless, this gives you a picture of what happened last year. And we produce these maps every year uh, to help track what happened and uh, analyze the trends. So when we're studying hailstorms, one of the tools that's probably the most useful is what we call hail swath maps. And these maps are utilizing data from weather radars to estimate what the size of hail is and where it fell. So this is a map from back in 2021 showing a really damaging hailstorm that formed south of Moose Jaw, passed near Regina, and then moved up toward Melville. Because the storm happened at the end of August, it was producing hail on top of crops which were really vulnerable to damage. And so it was costly for um, farmers and insurers because of that. These maps are really useful because they show you where a hail happened. So for farmers, it can help you identify uh, whether or not you might need to inspect your field for damage. For insurers, it helps them to more efficiently adjust claims by knowing where these storms were tracking and what their path was. It can also help to detect fraud or show areas where hail did and did not occur. Our insurance clients receive these maps on a daily basis showing yesterday's activity. And our agriculture subscribers who are farmers on the prairies, if you're a premium subscriber to that service, you also receive the map on a daily basis. Another tool that we have, which we're really excited about is our app. And in our app, what we do is we allow anybody who uses our app to submit a report if they observed hail. So if you saw hail, you can just simply press the plus button at the bottom of our app and make a report saying, I saw hail. What that does is it informs other users of the app that there was hail in the area, which then appears on the map that you see here. So this is a free app to download. You can get it in the App Store or Google Play. And by crowdsourcing this hail data and sharing it through our app, we're able to get a more complete picture of what's going on 
and we're also able to see these events in real time. So you see on our map here, I'm showing a quarter sized hail report that happened in North Winnipeg on August 24th. These reports were coming in as the storm was happening, so we knew in real time where hail was falling and what size it was. This year, we're expanding it further. We're going to allow people to continue making reports, but also include damage indicators in their reports. So telling us, you know, was their property damaged, were plants damaged, etc. And also include a picture of the hail if they want as well. So this is a really exciting development that this will be our first full year rolling it out. We did have it last summer as I showed, but this will be the first complete year. And so that is something that we're looking forward to. Another thing that we've been doing for many years is our hail forecasts. So every day we're producing hail forecasts across Canada. And what we're doing is identifying where is there a risk of hail every day? And how high is that risk? And what is the potential hail size that could fall from any storms that develop? So the top map here that you're looking at, that was from that August 24th hailstorm in Winnipeg. So we put this forecast out in advance of the event indicating that there could be hail up to tennis ball size in Manitoba on this day and including the risk area. So Winnipeg was in the risk uh, for these isolated severe storms. And you saw on our hail map that really isolated swath of hail that moved through the north side of the city. The bottom panel is a forecast we made for southern Ontario on July 20th. This was one of the most uh, severe events in Ontario last year and one of the uh, events that produced some of the largest hail on record. So we we're showing widespread severe activity that day and up to golf ball size hail. Uh, so both of these maps showing how in advance we predicted where hail would happen on these days and the severity of it. We do this every day. So these are just two examples, but we have many, many more examples that we draw from uh, when looking back at events that we forecast last year and years before that as well. So as we continue to develop new ways of monitoring hailstorms, we're always looking at uh, new opportunities. And so on this last slide, I just wanted to highlight a few things that we're working on. One of them is incorporating more insurance claims data into our database in order to get a more full picture of hail events. So using as much of this data as possible, what that's going to do is allow us to see where hailstorms typically have been occurring and what areas are at the highest risk for hail damage. We're also beginning to work with insurers on creating computerized hail adjusting tools based on our hail data. So we know that going out into the field and adjusting a field for hail damage is time consuming. Um, it can be difficult to find people who can do that and to train them. And so with some of our, our data sets, we're beginning to find ways that we can do some of that automatically and make the process easier for everybody. Lastly, encouraging citizens to document hailstorms. Uh, so that's happening through our app already. And we're also developing um, partnerships, uh, one I highlighted with the Northern Hail Project, where they're also documenting hailstorms uh, that happen uh, as they're out in the field collecting this data. So the last part, just I wanted to talk about what our expectations are for this hail season. So last year, um, I mentioned that in Alberta, it was roughly a normal year for hail activity. Saskatchewan was quite a bit below normal and Manitoba was a bit above normal. Now this year, this is what we're expecting. And that is showing a more active zone compared to 2023 from Southern Alberta into most of Southern Saskatchewan and Western Manitoba. The reason we're anticipating that is because of the waning of El Nino. You may have heard of El Nino and how it affected our winter giving most of Canada a pretty mild winter. El Nino is the water temperatures in the Pacific Ocean. And when an El Nino is weakening, as it is now, typically that will produce a more active weather pattern on the prairies, both in terms of precipitation and in terms of thunderstorm activity. So we've already started to see this spring a number of, you know, early in the spring snowstorms, and now just recently more rainstorms have begun moving across the prairies. That's hints of this pattern that we're expecting. And so as we move forward later in spring and summer, rather than getting uh, just you know rain or snow, some of this activity may manifest itself in the form of thunderstorms as the weather pattern turns more hot and humid, which as Matt discussed at the start, is really important fuel for thunderstorms and therefore hail.
So we've reached the end of, of the presentation, but now we've got some time for questions. So if you do have one, please enter that in the chat and we'd be happy to answer it for you. Yeah, thanks for that, Scott. Maybe I'll just start you off with a, a question that I had myself there. If you go back to uh, the chart where you had the Hill reports by province 2019 to 2023, looked like Alberta was a bit in a downtrend maybe, except last year. Um, do you have any comments on that, whether it's related to drought or whether that's just purely random? Well, I think part well. of it, yeah, I think for Alberta, the trend line maybe there um, isn't quite as clear as maybe Saskatchewan because we are talking about a drop, but as a percentage, it's maybe not as large um, as some other areas. But probably there is some influence of the drought on that. Um, we haven't studied that to you know, confirm the connection. But the thing about drought is that when your crops are not very healthy, um, they release less moisture or they release less humidity to the atmosphere. Because uh, as a crop is growing, it tends to produce a lot of uh, humidity through transpiration. And so when you have drought, that releases less humidity to the atmosphere and therefore that makes it more difficult to get severe weather. So in both Alberta and Saskatchewan, those dry conditions recently probably did play a bit of a role. There are other factors like the fact that, um, you know, this year we're having the waning El Nino tends to produce a more active weather pattern overall. We didn't see that in previous years. So that may also be part of the downtrend, but there are a lot of factors at play. I think the drought uh, could be, definitely could be one of them. Okay, thanks. I see a couple of people typing in the chat there. Yeah, Looks I see like one, one here about ENSO yeah. impact. So um, Ruping asks, um, how strong or significant is the ENSO impact in the summer season in the prairies? So by ENSO, he's referring to whether there's El Nino or La Nina in place. Um, in this season, we've studied the impact of a waning El Nino event. And if you look at charts showing the correlation between a weakening El Nino and prairie precipitation, there's definitely a correlation there. So typically when you have El Nino or weakening El Nino, the southern prairies tend to get more rainfall and also more thunderstorm activity. The reason for that is because the jet stream tends to dip down a little bit into the United States, especially the western United States, and that helps to form weather systems which move across the prairies and bring that precipitation. When the jet stream is deflected way off to the north of the prairies, that carries all of the active weather um, you know, to the north of the agricultural areas, giving less precipitation. And that's more of what we saw last year, but this year we're already beginning to see the jet stream being more active through the prairies. And so that's why we're anticipating more activity uh, this year. I guess with more moisture around too, that just helps fuel the thunderstorms further because there's more moisture available to the storms. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, I saw someone else typing there, so there might be another question coming. Uh, in the meantime, maybe uh, you could talk about uh, another question here that we had. Um, so how big does hail have to be to actually cause damage? Well, this is a very interesting question because typically meteorologists were only concerned about hail that we uh, say is severe, quote unquote severe. And I define that on this slide as being hail greater than two centimeters in diameter. So in Canada, in order to get a thunderstorm warning, or technically called a severe thunderstorm warning, the hail in the storm has to be anticipated at least two centimeters in diameter. And that's because we assume that was the, the size at which damage needed to occur. Interestingly, in the United States, they recently changed the criteria. So their warnings are for hail that is only uh, one inch or 25, um, or sorry, 2.5 centimeters in diameter and up. Um, so they did research showing that property damage is only likely when hail is at least 2.5 centimeters or one inch in diameter and, or greater. But the thing is, um, we're actually not thinking about uh, damage to crops, which is really important in Western Canada. And a lot of the crop damage we see happens with hail that's actually smaller. 
Um, what we'll see is a lot of hail, let's say it's pea or marble size in diameter, which is roughly a half inch, but really large volumes. And that's what tends to cause damage to crops. So is there a particular size that causes damage? Well, yes, but it depends what you're talking about. If it's a vehicle, it's got to be larger. If it's a crop, it really could be any size, but it depends a lot as well on the volume when we're talking about crops. Okay. Thanks for that, Scott. <clears throat> Uh, I'm not sure if there's any other questions. I did see someone typing earlier, but maybe they had their question answered while we were talking there. Uh, so maybe we'll give it uh, a couple more seconds. If not, uh, we can bring uh, the webinar to an end. And I guess just uh, just to follow up too with your, your comment on damage or Scott, it would also be somewhat dependent too on the hail type. Uh, so like I talked about the wet growth and the dry growth. Uh, the dry growth, you often need slightly larger hailstones to cause more significant damage, whereas the, the wet growth, sometimes you see dime size hail even damaging vehicles. So uh, that's another mm -hmm. part, uh, another variable here at play. <clears throat> yeah, if I recall, um, we've seen hail as small as marble size or half inch damage vehicles if it's wind driven and, and clear or wet growth. So <clears throat> yeah. There's no there's no set in stone rule for what will cause damage. It depends on a, a bunch of variables. Another question, mm -hmm. is there a definition for small hail? Um, that's a good point. We often talk about small or large hail. Uh, I think we usually talk about it a little bit too subjectively, but in my mind, small hail would be defined as anything that's not severe. So anything that's under two centimeters in diameter. But I think if we we're going to have a scientific um, research on topic of small hail, we should probably more formally determine what that is versus, um, let's say, even, you know, sometimes we talk about medium sized hail, well, what would that be or versus large versus severe? So in my mind, it's it's under two centimeters diameter, but I don't think there's any formal definition for small hail. But at least two, at least five millimeters, uh, five millimeters would be the smallest hailstone possible. That's by definition. Right. Yeah, the yeah. definition of hail it has to be five. So between five millimeters and 20 millimeters is typically what we would think about a small hail. But again, there's no formal definition. Mm -hmm. yeah. So with that, I think we'll wrap up for today. Um, I'd like to thank Matt for his presentation and uh, helping with the questions today. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. The, the talk will be available uh, on YouTube in the next couple of days. So if you'd like to send it around, you can do that. Um, but otherwise, uh, Good to join you all, and I hope uh, you have a, a safe and enjoyable summer. Thanks, everyone.